You're listening to School Counseling Simplified, a podcast with easy-to-implement strategies for busy school counselors. Here's your host, Rachel Davis, from Bright Futures Counseling. I am so excited to announce that it's time for our second annual Summer Summit. So what is the Summer Summit? This is my virtual conference for school counselors, and we have 15 amazing specialists, and they're going to cover a variety of topics. Guys, you're gonna love this. We have everyone from behavior specialists and therapists to trauma and inclusion experts. And of course, you'll be hearing from your fellow school counselors. Some of the topics cover leading courageous conversations through restorative forums, from burnout to balance, how do you summer break to strategize your burnout prevention and recovery, three joyful ways to center equity in your counseling practice, and tackling undesirable behaviors, helping teachers make classrooms thrive. You don't want to miss this. This is the perfect thing to do over your summer break to get you excited and ready for an awesome school year. So you might be thinking, yes, this sounds amazing. How do I sign up? Well, this conference is exclusive for Impact members, but no worries, you can totally join us. For $29, you can get your Summer Summit conference ticket plus your first month of Impact. Go to stressfreeschoolcounseling.com slash summit to check out the awesome lineup and all the details. The Summer Summit starts on June 20th, so hurry and check it out. Believe me, you don't want to miss this. Thanks for listening to School Counseling Simplified. Today, I have a very special guest on the podcast. I interview Laura from Positive School Counselor. Laura is amazing. She is all things picture books. Y'all, she is truly the expert in this area. I had some questions in mind and thought we were going to chat about a few things, but she blew me away with her knowledge when it comes to how school counselors can use picture books to enhance their counseling sessions. Like I said, she's really the expert in this area and she shines in this podcast. You're going to love this episode and Laura is presenting at our summer summit on this topic as well. So this is kind of a little sneak peek teaser of what her presentation is all about. You're going to love the session with Laura. If you haven't snagged your seat at summer summit yet, please don't hesitate. It is right around the corner and we cannot wait. To check out our awesome lineup of presenters and get all the details, go to stressfreeschoolcounseling.com slash summit. Okay, let's check out today's episode with Laura. Hey, Laura, how are you today? Hello, I'm doing well, thank you. It's so good to talk to you and to see you. We were just talking off air a little bit about the ASCA conference because I got yep. to meet you in person there. I guess it's been two I, years ago in Vegas. I know, I was I, yes, I was just reflecting on that today. It feels like so long ago and it was so good to finally meet people in person. That's like what I love about the ASCA conference, getting to meet people in pe- like in person. <laughs> I know, I know. And I'm going this year in Atlanta, but you're not. So I'm bummed. I know. <laughs> uh, but tell us a little bit about who you are and your background. Yes. So I'm Laura Feltness and I have been a school counselor Um for a very long time where I have to kind of get in my calculator and do the math. So since 2008, I have been a school counselor. I got my master's degree at MTSU in um, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and I'm still in Tennessee. I had grand plans to leave, but I'm still here in a school counselor um, in Knoxville, and I work on the board for the Tennessee School Counseling Association and um, my co-workers were teasing me this week because I had 153 hours of PD last summer. And I was like, I just love all things our, our job. Like I love right. to read about it. I love to listen to podcasts about it. So kind of dorky in that way. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my gosh. That is so many PD hours. Um, yeah. And- Too many probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it though. I love it. And I know I'm sure so many people are benefiting. So many kids benefiting from your investment. Um, yeah. No, I'm seeing the listeners obviously can't see you but you have on a book nerd hoodie right now too which is perfect I I thought it was perfect because I knew we were going to be talking about books and I wanted to get into that like headspace of how much I love books like I am a total book nerd (laughs) yes yes I love it so tell me how we're gonna dive deep about the benefits of using picture books in school counseling um but first kind of tell me how you got into books with your students um Well, I really have been a book nerd since I, for life, really. I remember in elementary school going to the library and like setting a goal of, I'm going to read every book in this library. Like I'm going to do it. Because of course I didn't have a school counselor to help me set a more realistic, smart goal. So like (laughs) I was determined. And then I kind of felt, not fell out of love with books. I just stopped reading as much. I like just 
life, you know, life happens and I wasn't reading as much. And then my first job, I started as a high school counselor and then I went to elementary and my first elementary school job, I just instantly became best friends with the school librarian there. And she just reignited this love for books. And I truly believe if you want your kids to be as passionate about your program as you are, you have to incorporate something you love into your program. I know when my students know that I'm like doing a lesson and I'm like, eh, only kind of halfway invested in, or I'm doing something, if I'm only halfway invested in it, then they're only going to be halfway invested in it. So I really found that I needed to kind of brand myself per se with incorporating things I loved into my program. So for me, that was dogs. Um, I was like the crazy dog counselor and books. So I just try to infuse books into every activity I can do. And I love it so much. And then the kids love it so, so much as well. Oh, I love it. That's so awesome. Yes. And so let's dive right in. I want to hear more about this. But yes, for those listening, you are the positive school counselor because <laughs> you love yep. the dogs too. Dogs I love I love it. Yep. Dogs and books. <laughs> awesome. So what are the benefits of using picture books in your school counseling program? There are so many benefits. First, your students are really going to be able to identify and relate to the characters. Maybe it's the character's journey or how they're feeling in the story, but they're going to be able to relate. And just like in our like small group counseling, where that's like that sense of um, like universality, like, oh, I, I felt that way too. So they can hopefully identify a time they have felt that way or a time that they have um, had an experience like the counselor so they can see it in themselves. I also think they provide great insight, um, awareness to some, maybe some feelings. Um, so quick, my students are to say, I've got anger management issues or I've got anger problems. So I love bringing out books to talk about different ways to look at it. Maybe you're feeling lonely or left out and you're not really angry. So I think it provides a lot of great insight. And depending on the right book, you can really identify potential solutions to problems um, and really teach skills. And also is sometimes just really cathartic to just read about a book and to go, oh my gosh, yes, I relate. And I have all these emotions that somebody's helped me identify and I can relate to it. So there are so many benefits to um, books. I remember a couple of years ago, I had a teacher um, that was at a staff meeting that said, I just don't think our kids like to read anymore. And that's why our reading scores are going down. And I was just like, well, I don't think that's true at all. I think we're just, you're not reading the right books to mm -hmm. them. And I will say, I think that's really true. I think picture books especially are ageless. They're timeless. And I can't tell you how many times I've got to the end of a picture book and my students start clapping and I get goosebumps because <sighs> I'm like, I know I loved that book too. <laughs> so it's not only helping them with their their literacy, which we know all schools are working on their literacy, but you're also working on their mental health literacy. You're helping them identify feelings and emotions. And so there's just, and there's so much um, wonderful research out there on, on books. Not as much research as I have found when I was preparing for this. I thought, oh, I really want to plot some really good research for you. <laughs> and there hasn't been as much I found um, with bibliotherapy in the school setting. So Maybe that'll be our next a great thing. Um, but I did find some studies to show that bibliotherapy in children, when also supplemented with a therapist or parent contact, um, could be far more effective. So it's just like another tool in your counselor toolbox to make you more effective. Oh, I, I love think all of this. Yeah. So I think they're wonderful. And so many of our families might not have access to resources or services. But luckily, we have our public library, we can all go down to the public library. So for some of my parents who can't buy things on Amazon or workbooks, or whatever, I'm like, Oh, check out this book at your public library, because you can have access to it, like read it with your kiddos. So um, it's just a great intervention. And a gr books are a great tool to have in your counseling um, toolbox, because they're not only preventative, but they're responsive as well. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love this so much. Just a few things caught out to me. First off, you're talking about the library, which is excellent because I know so many listeners are probably like, oh, I need to go buy like 20 books on Amazon now and put yeah. it in my office. But take yes. advantage of your school library, of your public library, a um, lot of free resources there. There are. And I am that guilty counselor. Um, a couple of years ago, I tried to start inventory of my books and I hit like 700 and I was like, I'm a book 
addict for sure. <laughs> but I would see some like a book on Pinterest or I would see another counselor and I would, I would just add it to my Amazon cart, um, and which I love owning books. So it wasn't a big deal, but maybe I was only using it once or twice. Mm-hmm. So your public library. And um, I remember presenting at ASCA a couple of years ago and I said, go to your school librarian and say, when are you doing your next big book order? Would you be willing to order these books? Mm-hmm. So if you have a school librarian, do it. That is also how I found out that some schools don't have a school librarian. Um, but if you do, they're a wonderful, wonderful resource. So think about your your free options for sure. Yes, absolutely. I know. So I'm I'm in Costa Rica and we actually don't have like a public library system, but my neighbor is spearheading this like community children's community library and I'm helping with it. And I'm yeah. just thrilled because we can finally I've been spending so much money on books and then I'm like ordering them in the States and putting them in a suitcase and they weigh a ton. So Exactly. And I have worked with our PTA. We at several schools, we've done a little free library Mm -hmm. and you would be amazed Um, if you're in the United States, Dolly Parton's free imagination library is so good. I'm going to get in trouble for ratting on myself, but I signed up my youngest dog for her, for Dolly (laughs) Parton's. Um, But there's so many resources. I mean, like just Googling free books. So like I'm working with your PTA and your community. And then I've actually been um, very proud to say I've written a couple of grants where I included book Mm. titles in them as well. And so even if you're not a grant writer, go to your school librarian and be like, I've been thinking about writing this grant. And I have a a library in fact who wrote a library grant to include more trauma informed books in diverse, diverse books in her uh, library. And she worked directly with the school counselor to pick out titles. So it doesn't have to be just be you. Right, right. This is amazing. I love it so much. And the librarian, I feel like mm-hmm. kind of like our profession, they probably feel kind of like they're on their own island and isolated. Yes. So they're yes. probably like itching for some collaboration too. Yes. Oh my gosh. I collaborate with my librarians as much as I can. Um, I still talk about this lesson to this day. My uh, best friend, Sarah Swarta and I, we collaborated on a book, I'm Bored by Michael Ian Black. And it was one of my most favorite lessons. It's about a little uh, a girl who meets a potato and she's just, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. And like the whole thing is like, how can she problem solve? Is she really bored? It's, it was so fun. And we did it right before summer. Mm-hmm. Um, and we told the kids we were going to pick one student that was the best listener in every class to win a potato. And we literally just had a potato in a, a lunch bag. And then that student could... Um, at the end of class, let me go back at the end of the lesson, we wrote down all the things they could do in the summer if they got bored um, and all the things they could do with the potato. What would they do with the potato? And some kids were like, take a bubble bath with it, turn it into a pet dog. I mean, just <laughs> wild ideas. And then that the kid who was the most well-behaved got to take home their potato. And then if they had time before the end of the year, they did something with their potato, they could share it with us. And I cannot express to you how like engaged those kids are in this lesson to win a potato. So <laughs> that collaborate. Is uh, but it was such a fun yeah. team lesson to teach about problem solving and resiliency and coping with that feeling of being bored. So yes, it's collaboration is key. I love that. I love that so much. And then I'm thinking something else I was thinking with the librarian is like, for example, if it's like mental health awareness month or something, they usually Mm -hmm. have like a table where they're showcasing a theme every month or like women's history or something. You could contribute like, hey, let's focus on this this month and help them pull some titles. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I felt like I could do a whole podcast about the collaboration I did with my friend, Sarah Swarta. We did so many um, parent workshops together. And I was very lucky. We were at a school where we had a lot of parents that would come in and they were really actively involved in the the parent workshops where some of my schools, I knew I was going to have zero, but at this school, we definitely were. And no matter what the title was, we always pulled out books for that topic. So not only did we do it for the parents, but then we would pull it out for the books. So if we were doing like a mental health awareness, we might pull out some books and say, parents, like read these with your kids. And then they um, we'd also put them out for our students as well as like, hey, these were handpicked. Kids love it when you say like this book has been selected by like Miss Filtness or, Mm. you know, your counselor has picked out this book. So we put tags on the book like Miss Filtness recommends and. She I love that. Say, oh, the, yeah, me too. <laughs> I love like, the recommendation. Editor's pick or staff pick. Yeah. Yep. 
And then when we would, she would do a new book order, we would invite the teachers in early um, and say, you get first pick of the book before the kids even get it to check out the book early. And I would be in there and we would talk about like, if you're going to read this book, oh, think about including this with it. Or here's like a little social emotional mini lesson you could do with this book. And the teachers loved it because they got first dibs. And then I would have like a resource or like maybe a million mini lesson ready for them to go. So they were like, oh, that's easy for me to do in my class meeting kind of thing. So yeah. yes, like make it with your themes of your month you're already doing. Yes. I love that so much. And then I'm just thinking how you were saying this kids not only will like see themselves in the books, but it really puts words to things mm-hmm. they don't even know they're feeling necessarily. Exactly. And- which is so important for kids who may not have the language yet. But even as an adult, the other day, I was like struggling through something and I'm like, I just need to like read it. I need someone else to have done this and written it down. That yes. I, can, I can't like <laughs> process it. Like I know journaling is good, but I almost needed to like read it from someone else who could say it better. Than yes. I, could. Um, I just had such a similar moment. I was reading The Quiet Power by Susan Cain and I am not necessarily like super introverted or super extroverted. I'm kind of like right in the middle. And she wrote something. I was like, yes, that's what I've been trying to say this whole time. Yeah, and I can't exactly. remember exactly what it was, but she, she nailed it for me. Yeah. You just feel so <laughs> validated. Yes, um, totally. Awesome. So let's talk about how counselors can use this in each tier. So if we're doing it like in our class lessons with small groups, individuals, what are some practical ideas? Yes. So we've kind of already touched on a few tier ideas, like doing it school, school wide, like doing, um, you know, having them out at workshops and having them out for the kids. Um, I include them in a lot of my lessons in my small groups. So that kind of goes into tier one, tier two. I like to use them as an icebreaker, just something fun to get kids thinking about it. Um, Depending on the book, if it's very um, specific, um, for example, I used How to Apologize this year, which is such a great book um, because we were doing a lesson on apologizing and they needed to see specific examples of what is a sincere apology, what is an insincere apology. So you want to always check out your book beforehand um, just to see how specific it gets. But that was a great one. And it's how, how to apologize by David LaRochelle. And um, so it was a great one for my class lessons because I had taught the skill. Then I like, we read the book, we read it, we discussed it, we thought about it. And then we got to role play what they had just read about and identify it. So you can use it in your class lessons and your small groups. Like I said, is this um, to model a specific skill just as an icebreaker. Sometimes it's just a discussion starter. I found in a lot of my grief groups or divorce groups, um, we might read a book and just say, you know, have you ever felt that way? Or like, and if you need to take it one step back, like how do you think the character's feeling? Because sometimes our kids are a little more comfortable with saying, um, I think the character's feeling this way. And you know, that's how they're feeling, but they might not feel that comfortable in a small group setting, sharing that feeling yet. Um, In fact, um, I know Sarah Carlo just did some really cool research on self-distancing and that's just a really cool self-distancing strategy. Um, And I remember her sharing that self-distancing, self-talk strategies help increase perseverance and help students with their executive functioning skills. So when you're reading a book, you might just say, like, what advice would you give to that character? If you could talk to that character, what would you tell them? Um, Or what do you think the character should do? So it leads to some really cool small group and classroom lesson um, discussions. Another um, fun character, Ed, one I did for years, we would have mystery readers. So this was kind of a tier one. I would ask my teachers, I would pick a book that was related to our character education trait and ask them to be our mystery reader. So they would read it, but they would record themselves kind of hidden. I had one teacher who went all out with this, like sat by a fireplace and you could just (laughs) see the fire and the book. And at the very end, she panned out to see her face. Um, But the teachers would show it in class as if I was going to do, you know, a lesson on respect, they would show up beforehand to get kids already thinking and talking about respect. And they ate it up and everybody in the whole school building got into it. Yeah, Who's the mystery reader of the month? I think it's so-and-so. 
Um, and then of course your last tier, you working with individual kids, you can use it when you're just reading one-on-one -on -one with a student. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes a student will just be talking to me and I'll be thinking, oh, that just reminds me of a book. And I'll say to them like, oh, that reminds me of a book. Have you ever read this book? Like, let's read it together. Um, I think you always want to be careful when you are reading books with children individually. Um, so I always caution you as you're picking that book because you wouldn't, um, especially your characters with that are neuro neurodiverse, you don't ever want the students to feel like they have a problem and you're reading this book to fix them or that the character needs to be fixed. So whenever you're thinking about which book to pick, always think about your audience um, and then always think about how and if it will validate that student experience. I love that. That was my next question is how do we know which books to pick? I mean, for that reason is excellent. And then also just because of the sheer volume of options, how do we know where to start? Oh my gosh. There's so, so, so many. Um, and so I always suggest you choose carefully. If you're looking to books to add to your library shelf, go to your library shelf and see what you already have books on. I would bet most of us have a wide array of books on anger. I mean, I have just so, so many books on anger because they're so easy to find. Um, but maybe I have less on grief or I have less on a specific topic. So look at your library shelf, look at what topics you already have a ton of books for and look where your holes or your gaps might be. And then compare that to what your needs assessment is saying, what your referrals for were next year, because it's so easy to find a cute new book on anger management. But if you're not really seeing kids about that, then you're just buying a really cute little book, mm -hmm. uh, which is fun. And But <laughs> will you use it? So be thoughtful of, um, before you purchase your book. But then also making sure it's current. Um, you can use uh, websites like Goodre or Goodreads and um, Common Sense Media to just check out um, you know, parent reviews or parent concerns, make sure it's really relevant to your, your population. I remember, um, reading some of my most favorite books for years and years and years. And, um, it just maybe doesn't as relevant for my kids now, for example, um, each kindness by Jacqueline Woodson is still one of my favorite books. I still whip it out every year. But the story is about a girl who's being teased because she's wearing secondhand clothes. And my kids can resonate with the character. They can resonate with the teasing. But thrifting and secondhand clothes have become so cool and popular now. That part of the story, they're just like, but why? Why would they yeah, tease her about that? Like, it used to be, you know, almost embarrassing to have something from Goodwill. And now they're like, yeah, but that's that's where I shop. I'm like, I know. Yeah. So <laughs> think about it, it, its relevance to your specific population mm -hmm. that you're working with. Um, always you want to pick materials and books that embrace culture and respect and um, that are inclusive. And then I always think as I'm reading a book, is this character portrayed in a way that I agree with or I disagree with, or would I want my students to generalize with um, mm -hmm. if they were making a teaching point? So be thoughtful about those characters. And then of course, when you're looking at tier two, tier three, so using books with small groups or individual kids, think about your students' reading level, their comprehension level. Um, their interests, their personal experiences. And I often worked really closely with my ESL teacher to see if it was um, too figurative or there were too many puns and it just was going to be lost on my students. So working with your teachers to collaborate on their comprehension as well is important. Yes, those are some really good guidelines. Um, thank you for that. I didn't even think yeah. about those mm -hmm. things <laughs> at all. So that's a really good tip. We just need you to tell us, like, use these books. <laughs> we <need> to <laughs> but no, I see how it can be unique per school for sure. And per it student. really is. I, I will tell you, like, one of the most common questions I got on Instagram is, what grade level did you use this book with? And I'm always like, I can't, or what would you use this mm -hmm. book with? And I want to be like, quit asking me because right. I've worked at a, a school for gifted and high achieving students and they just got books with puns and mm -hmm. then I could take that same book to another school and my kids would be like I don't get that joke at all it's so right. specific to your kids um and what they love and I truly just think like some picture books even when I was at high school I like loved having um what would you do with an idea or what do you do with a problem because sometimes they just 
transcend through time. You know, like I'm an adult who loves picture books and can resonate with the picture books. So uh, please ask me, but don't ask me what grade level. Cause I'm always <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm right, panicking. Right. I don't know your kids. <laughs> right. hundred um, percent. Awesome. Now let's talk about companion activities. So if we are going to create a class lesson around mm-hmm. a book, if we're doing, let's say like bullying prevention month we have a book and then we're going to do the companion activities what do you recommend I mean first things that are coming to my mind are like discussion based activities but do you have yes things specific and um I'm going to do some PDs this summer on exactly that on how to make those discussion based things cooperative learning activities um how you can instead of you just asking the kids and they're talking to you or our um turn and talk how you can use cooperative activities. So where um, they're playing ask, ask, switch to discuss it. Of course, scoot and scramble is one of my favorite things. If like, say we're doing a, a bullying book, maybe I take examples or situations from the book um, and I write them out on cards and maybe add to it. And then the students have their scoot scramble page where they go around and they have to identify was that bullying or not bullying um, just so to check their comprehension that they, that they understand that definition of bullying um, and scoot and scramble. I can talk a lot about, but it's just where your students are moving around the room and looking at those discussion questions that you would normally ask them and they're, they're reading it. Um, task cards is really what I was going to say. You can do so many things with task cards Um for almost every book I have, I try to make a set of task cards because not only does it help me guide my reading, but we can do so many cooperative activities afterwards. Teamwork games are always super fun to partners with books. Um, Role playing is always really fun. Um, So role play, coaching through modeling that skill that they talked about in the book. Yes, I love those activities. So your Mm -hmm. scoot and scramble, is that because I do scoot games, so I just call them scoot games. I'm wondering if I'm missing something with the, the scramble. Okay, piece. so scoot, how I was always learned it was the, the kids would have like a row of their desks and you would scoot to the next desk. Like mm-hmm. you would go in order from like desk one to two right. to three, um, which is great. Scramble is more like I put the cards around. I'm going to just let you go. You can go on your own time, okay. your own free will. Instead of giving a designated time to go from task card one to task mm-hmm. card two, you kind of like have free reign. And I find that's really good because I have some kids that are slower readers, some kids that get really hung up on one particular mm-hmm. question. And there's something very exciting about like I've hidden, but I haven't really hidden the cards. I mean, they're out there, obvious, but I'm like, they're around the room. Go find <laughs> them. And they right. they love that kind of free reign of going. Mm-hmm. So I used to do scoot a lot, um, but also depending on your classroom, I uh, ended up in a classroom the last couple of years where we had no desks. I had mm-hmm. my own classroom. They came to me, but we had no desks. So scoot was very hard. So we started to scramble. The test mm-hmm. cards are there go scramble. And they loved it. (laughs) Oh, I love that. Great idea. Okay. So you've already mentioned some great recommendations and you'll have to send me all these so I can link to them in the show notes. Um, but what are your top three favorite books to use with students? This was, five. <laughs> I know I I once tried to do a blog post on my favorite books and I got to the end. It was like, well, I basically just said all the books. Um, <laughs> it's really hard. I try to always just share my current new favorite finds um, on my Instagram because there are so many. But if you were like going to force me to like pick, I will say um, I linked to all my favorites on my curriculum map too, because I love to partner books with, um, with, uh, my classroom lessons, but the bad series I have teased that Jory John has basically given me my curriculum for third grade and he continues to write more. And I don't know how I'm going to do more lessons in the year, <laughs> but it's um, the bad seed, the good egg, mm-hmm. the smart cookie. He has a new one coming out that I'm so, so excited about. So that whole series is phenomenal. Um, similarly, Michael Ian Black has the um, I'm Bored, I'm Worried, I'm Sad series. And I love a series with um, a group of students because you can use it like each time I go back, I can like build upon it and they love it. They're like, oh, we just read the last one in this series. I'm like, I know. Um, Trudy Ludwig always has some of my favorite titles. So I know it's not a specific title, but it is a good author. Um, the Invisible Boy that she wrote, I read every year. I think it's just so amazing. And, um, and she wrote Sorry as well, which is a great book. And then if I had to pick one book, I think every school counselor should own it is The Rabbit Listened. Mm. I think um, The Rabbit Listened is such a phenomenal book on introducing 
your role as a school counselor, how you're not there to fix, you are there to listen. I use it with my fourth graders to talk about how we can be a good friend and mindfully listen. That's a super fun one for my kids to tell me how they um, how they treat each other. Are they more like the, the snake in the book that's plotting to get revenge when their friend is hurt? Or are they more like the hyena? They try to get their friends laughing when their friend is having a bad day. Um, and it's also a beautiful book to use in grief groups. It's just a book I pull off my bookshelf over and over and over again. And I'm so fearful of losing it that I have four copies because I <laughs> love that book so much. Um, so the rabbit listen, uh, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are like, yes, I have that one. But think about just how many different ways you can use it. So, so quick we are to pull out a book once. But I will read a book over and over and over again with the kids. So I might read it at the beginning of the year to introduce myself, but then we'll whip it back out and they'll say, we already read this. I'm like, I know I can't wait to read it again. Let's see what we pick up the second time. So give yourself permission to read books with a class or a group or an individual more than once. Mm, I love that. And I just know the teachers you work with are thrilled, like for the literacy skills, <laughs> like you were saying, yeah. because so often yeah. I feel like you know, we have to pull teeth to get them to miss instructional time. So to know that we're using books and counseling is great. That is so true. And I love doing book clubs with the students. There's mm -hmm. so many wonderful book clubs, like um, New Kid is a really fun book um, that I've used for book clubs. And there are so many. And then here's another um, insider trick to finding books for book clubs. If you need a stash, go to your librarian or curriculum specialist or whoever it is in your school and ask them if there's any old books they're going to discard. That is how I got tons of copies of 100 dresses, which is a timeless book on for bullying prevention and teasing and um, relational aggression. So go to them, ask them what books they're going to discard and see if you can, you can have them. And book clubs are such a fun, fun way. I am not a fan of doing um, small groups during lunch at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. I just think it's really hard to teach skills and to be productive, but I love doing book clubs because they can sit in and listen to me read, they can take turns reading. Um, and we can have so many in depth discussions in a really relaxed way where I'm not stressing about having to teach a skill in 30 minutes while they also eat. Right? No, I agree. At lunch, lunch is hard. But that's a great idea <laughs> with the book. Yeah. Class. Oh, this is so yeah. good. Thank you so much, Laura. These are great tips. You are so welcome. For listeners, Laura is presenting at our summer summit on this topic. So I, as you can tell, she's super passionate about it. And I cannot wait to hear more and to learn yeah. in her way. So this is kind of like a little teaser of her presentation. Um, yeah. Side question. I just want to know, what are you personally reading right now? <laughs> That's a great <laughs> question. Um, I oh, So many things. Okay. I, I used to have this, um, I don't know, like, it was like this weird rule. I felt like when she picked up a book, you had to finish it. Yes. And it's okay. I want to tell people it's okay to not finish a book. Um, it's it's very rare I do that. So I just was trying to start a book and I was like, I just cannot get into this. So I put it down and I'm like, okay with that. So I have picked up a couple of other books and I like to alternate between um, like adult books and young adult books. So I love to go back and forth. So I just finished Reputation, which is not a young adult book, but it reads like uh, Pretty Little Liars. Okay. It's like reading Pretty Little Liars. So that was like my, okay, I'm back into my reading mm -hmm. Reputation. And then um, I am also currently, oh, what is that? Oh my gosh. Now I've forgotten. Uh, All the Beautiful Girls, oh, which okay. is very good. But um, for all our readers out there, trigger warning, it is yeah. really intense. Um, about sexual assault, mm. but it is about her journey through the sexual assault. And I, there are so many counselor moments where I'm like, oh, oh that's so intriguing and fascinating, um, but it's great. So, and I, I think I saw that one. Yeah. A, I know what you one. know, what you mean about mm -hmm. the, the DNF mm -hmm. or the do not finish because I uh -huh. felt guilty too. Yes. And then it was like mm -hmm. to the point where in my Goodreads, I would <laughs> Like not want to remove it. So I have like five things in my currently yes. reading. Like I think Atomic yes. Habits has been in there for like three yes. years. <laughs> yes. But, uh, I'm terrible. Nonfiction is the like the one that I like can do like a chapter of nonfiction mm -hmm. and then I have to put it down. I have to read some fiction. Okay. I've got my momentum going. I'll read another chapter of nonfiction. Um, so I made a New Year's resolution this year to read only nonfiction. 
Uh, See, good for you. <laughs> fiction. I but it's mean, so hard. It's so hard. It's so so hard. Well, so you I just keep reading memoir, which is like this like, is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't put this on your list because it's fiction. But I like want to shout it from the rooftops. If if you are out there listening to this and you have not read Lessons in Chemistry, it was my favorite book last year. Okay. I I've heard a review by N- Nigella Lawson, the chef that like you were just sad when the book ended. And I was like, well, that's interesting. And it was, I slowed down on reading it because I did not want that book to end. Okay. But it is fiction, Rachel. It's fiction. What so we have you have to read it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing. No, that's good. No, the the fiction thing's been tough to the point where I was like rereading something. And I was like, this is- so Well, you just- know, I think my, my nonfiction go-to is Brene Brown. I mm, just- So good. So, oh, I just love all things Brene Brown. Mm-hmm. And yes. And then there's every once in a while, I always think this is a book that we've all read, but just it, I realized maybe somebody hasn't, but The Body Keeps Score is oh, a yes. great one for mm-hmm. counselors that are into nonfiction. So if there's anybody out there that's not read that, um, I actually got to hear Bessel speak at a conference a couple years ago mm-hmm. and it was amazing. Yeah, so I read those one. are my nonfiction recommends, but awesome. I, that's not my genre typically. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Laura. This is fascinating. So many good ideas. This conversation went like above and beyond of what I had planned. So thank you. Well, I can't wait ideas. to present at your conference because there's just so many wonderful things we can do with picture books. I'm excited to share all those ideas. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And where can the listeners find you you if they want to see your Instagram and your book recommendations? Yep. So it's Positive School Counselor, P-A-W-S, like pause, Mm -hmm. positive school counselor. And that's what I am on. Instagram is probably my most active. Um, I'm like aging myself when it comes to social media. (laughs) Uh, But I do have like a Facebook and an Instagram. And sometimes I remember to TikTok if I'm feeling super young. (laughs) <laughs> um, and I also have a blog that's just positive school counselor.com. Awesome. We will link to all that in the show notes and you'll have to send me your book that we've chatted about in this episode and we'll link to everything there as well. So. Yes. Don't forget to remind me. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for listening to school counseling simplified. You can find the links from today's episode in the show notes. If you'd like to connect with Rachel, she's on Instagram and Teachers Pay Teachers at Bright Futures Counseling. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes of School Counseling Simplified. Talk to you next week.